Okay, so um, good morning to everyone, and uh, we're going to um, have a, uh, a really like full uh, final day uh, for lecture contents uh, for this boot camp. Uh, tomorrow, the, the incubators will be continuing, but um, uh, today is the day where I expect uh, to finish up um, virtually all of the lecture contents beyond anything explicitly requested for tomorrow. Um, and uh, to that end, I was um, going through the schedule again. Um, and uh, I have posted a sort of default anticipated plan um, for today, but um, I'm going to need to uh, elicit some feedback for that. And um, I'll be doing that uh, in just a little bit here. But uh, first, I wanted to reflect on yesterday, because what struck me in that review of, of where we're at is the number of topics that we at least touched on, and um, in some cases really went into in greater depth uh, yesterday. So uh, during yesterday's uh, material, uh, we really made a broad transect through uh, a variety of topics. Uh, now, we started off after the retrospective with some discussion of the roles of scenarios. And um, we, we spoke about the roles that the baseline scenario plays uh, in comparison with alternative scenarios. And I noted the frequent interest in comparison of scenarios with the baseline. In fact, the baseline, what distinguishes the baseline scenario is that it typically constitutes the reference scenario against which other uh, scenario output is judged. And uh, in that in that discussion, um, I had noted, you know, alternative scenarios can be of interventions or it can be um, of other sorts of counterfactuals involving exogenous conditions, for example. Uh, now, later today, we're going to be returning to the issue of scenarios a little bit more, specifically. To, to go beyond talking about scenarios that consist of single runs of the model, single simulations, to instead what we might term ensembles of realizations or of, of, of groups of realizations to provide a statistical confidence about the regularities in the results. Uh, however, beyond um, the scenarios, which really occupied us just during the very first part of the morning. Uh, we also spoke about two other system science traditions. I introduced system dynamics, and I introduced discrete event simulation. And noted that system dynamics, like agent-based modeling, is uh, a tradition with very broad spheres of applicability. It's, it's very, very general. It can be used for a, a wide variety of, of different types of modeling needs. But it really excels at characterizing the dynamics of, of continuous state variables, um, of continuous quantities. Um, and a huge amount of theory across many, many domains has been built up Con uh, been characterized as differential equation models, ordinary differential equation models of continuous systems that can be quite readily placed into a system dynamics. Great work. Um, by contrast, discrete event simulation has a more distinct focus, a valid sort of sphere of, of concentration, which is resource-limited flows 
along to find workflows um, and, and being able to understand how the throughput, the latency, the end-to-end -end time, throughput, the number of units that can be handled per day, the waiting times and waiting lists, et cetera, change in response to resource availability and placement, et cetera. This is a tradition which has had huge impact on service delivery professions in areas like factory design, where there are very well-defined workloads, but also in health system processes, health service delivery. Um, there have been likely a thousand or more models built using discrete event simulation techniques for emergency room, emergency room operations, for example. It is an exquisite language, expressive, concise, visually transparent, broadly accessible, requires minimal programming, declarative, for this, this sizable class of health service delivery and more broadly service delivery spheres. And uh, it, it allows for very sort of elegant investigation of issues within those spheres. Now, that coverage of those, of those areas set us up well for a discussion of hybrid modeling. And uh, in the hybrid modeling context, we saw a variety of types of hybrid models. I, I concentrated on five compelling patterns, things like service population interaction was the first of them, or agents with which are whose dynamics are driven in whole or in part by uh, system dynamics, stock flow models, et cetera. Um, in cases where we have upstream system dynamics flowing into agents, et cetera. And uh, these hybrid techniques um, often serve great value. Uh, they um, secure great value from these multiple techniques uh, of modeling. And uh, sometimes those models are articulated at multiple scales where, for example, at one scale, we may use a system dynamics model, a stock flow model, and then a scale or two up from that, we may use um, an agent-based model and potentially discrete event simulations uh, interfacing with that. So sometimes it's a matter of multi-scale modeling. Um, sometimes that's the, the context in which we weave together these different traditions. In other cases, it's lateral, like an upstream system dynamics stock flow model in a downstream agent-based model or discrete event simulation model. Um, these are very powerful combinations. They play to the strengths of the different approaches. They can make model modeling more nimble as well by allowing you to change the boundary between these the areas captured in these domains as your learning evolves. However, we also use that as a jumping off point or, or as a chance to go into more detail in one area, which was um, health economic related modeling. And we did a bit of a deep dive on a hybrid model uh, whose hybrid character captures fairly elegantly health economic quantities, such as cumulative life years, quality adjusted life years, costs born from interventions and from various health states and from particular events, excuse me, like like a transplant, occurrence of transplants or childbirth um, or occurrence of a, of a um, cardiac arrest or what have you. 
something that's conceptually brief. Um, so we we saw models uh, a model used in that context, uh, and uh, and saw how the basic logic of it could be translated to many other domains. So it was nothing terribly specific or contingent upon or limited to that particular model structure, the particulars of the health conditions being investigated. Now, some of those hybrid models also emphasized the next topic to which we were headed, which was focused on spatial embedding and mobility. So, for example, we had a hybrid model in which there were individuals circulating to different environments and picking up pathogen from those environments, say surfaces in those environments, or certain areas of the working environment that might be contaminated with pathogen, perhaps in a in a in a barn or what have you and and then taking those pathogens home where they could spread at home and then be brought back so something like mrsa methicillin resistance to philococcus aureus this this drug resistant commonly drug resistant bug might be brought by a nurse home to his home environment home from the hospital or from a long-term care facility to his home environment. Uh, and then perhaps he moons, moonlights as a nurse in a long-term care facility might bring it there. And other residents or visitors there might bring it and, and visit other environments. And you get this contamination among environments. So we, we then turned our attention to spatial environments and and spoke about the different contexts in which we make use of spatial environments or different motivations for that and different uh, different ways in which we characterize the spatial environment. Some are discrete, some are continuous, but not geographic. Some are irregular, think the trauma center model where we have that layout of a hospital. And some are geographic. And we have circulation and geography among, among resources in a community. All of these fit within the spatial modeling tradition. Now, as I noted, you can have spatial modeling absent mobility. So you might have situated agents affected by nearby pollution levels, for example. Um, and, and use a model fruitfully for that. But in many cases, we secure value by having mobile agents who go and interact with resources in a certain area. Um, in, a, in a localized fashion. And that's very common and leads this interesting interplay between mobility, carrying things on the one hand, versus contagion passing from one place to another without movement. Think from a person to a person within a within a facility, room to room in a long-term care facility. So mobility can often accelerate diffusion beyond what contagion can spread. And actually, it interplays with contagion. It can be someone can get infected, contagiously carry it with them, and then, and then spread it to others. So we had this really whirlwind look at spatial embedding and that look um 
may have clued you into areas of relevance in your context. Suffice it to say that there's quite a few different ways to build up, um, build up insightful location-based environments. Um, we also talked a little bit about the interplay between spatial location and networks, where networks may change as one's location changes. Networks may be formed based on spatial location um, that is static, and then people are connected to nearby people. They're posited to have connections that reach a certain distance within that environment. Occasionally, the network is a network of spatial locations uh, that are reachable from each other. Maybe it's a it's a metro system, a subway system, and you get you know locations that can be easily reached from that. Or it's a diffusion environment for for air travel, and you have these nodes within a network within a graph and uh, that represent locations. So that was yesterday and we, we touched on um, a lot of different material there. There is a topic which keeps on arising and it actually relates to this material, but really it's, it's writ large through the boot camp material as a whole. And uh, it relates to one of the requests from the initial survey, which I, I've i sought to, to, to try to emphasize, but I figured I'd, I'd give it one more point of attention here. It's kind of been pointed to by at, at a number of occasions, and I feel I, I need to speak to it. So to that end, I am seeking to share my screen here, and I'm going to see. Uh, so could one of the TAs let me know, are you seeing my slides here? Okay. Okay. So I want to talk, I'm going to use this to sort of help better appreciate some of the comments being made over the course of the boot camp about different classes of models. And I'm also gonna use it to feature another type of spatial embedding that I referred to, but I didn't speak about uh, while still keeping my remarks brief. So, um, we spoke about on the very first day a variety of types of uses of modeling. And in fact, I I, I had a, a list of on the order of, I don't know, six to eight of them, something like that. Uh, but beyond those, um, there have been dozens compiled, people like Don Berg or uh, from University of Pittsburgh, who was head of uh, University of Pittsburgh's School of Public Health for many years, um, a good colleague, or Josh Epstein, uh, who was at Johns Hopkins, it is now at, I think, NYU. Um, they've compiled, you know, dozens of ways in which models um, uh, models are, are used, for example. Um, and within this slide deck on the first day, you know, I talked about about some uses here. Um, but one thing I didn't really touch on at that point was an important distinction that in some ways um, cuts across those uses. Not, not quite, it's not orthogonal. It's not, it's not, it's not at right angles to that. It's, um, it interplays with it a bit. Some of those uses um, uh, are compatible with with this distinction that I'm going to be making all across the distinction. Others are more on one side or the other. 
And that is a distinction between two broad types of, of, of uses of models uh, or two broad ways in which models are situated with respect to theory. So I spoke about in that first day, models as tools to help us learn more quickly, more deeply, more reliably, more, more uh, robustly up from empirical evidence, for example, to up blinking weight weighted. Yeah, I got it. Mm -hmm. Um, to help us cross-check our understanding of the world. And it is true that models serve in that way, particularly when we're dealing with well-defined theory. But the fact is that models can be used for with more well-developed theory or theory where you have you have grounds for beginning a, a really structured, um, more articulated theory of that area. But they can also be used to build up theory. They can be used to sort of brainstorm about theory, to, to sort of cast about for theoretical underpinnings for what you're seeing from the world or from the sorts of behavior that are noted through lived experience in, in more general terms. And so we, and I'm, I'm grateful to my colleague, Russ Hammond, uh, formerly Brookings, now at, at uh, Washington University in St. Louis, for this distinction between, on the one hand, theory building models and theory explication models. Um, and Russ, they're coining these terms, but others, including myself, have, have used different terms. So theory building models are sometimes ter termed stylized models. That's one of the terms you'll hear me using a lot. Uh, Michael Wolfson calls, so, calls them toy models. Um, others, Carl Simon, um, I think it's a missing age there, calls it uh, caricature models. And the analogy he makes, which I, I rather like, is um, of the sort of caricatures you see in political cartoons. Um, and maybe this is a generational thing. Uh, we used to see them in newspapers more. But, you know, it would show different Canadian prime ministers with, you know, their faces. But they're they're not photorealistic renditions of their faces. They're, they they bring out essential features in pronounced ways. So maybe it's a giant chin, right? Um, for for a certain Canadian prime minister. Or certain American presidents might bring out the ears, you know, sticking out of someone, um, or a mustache for for somebody, right? Um and the point is not that you are characterizing you're, you're capturing um, the exact likeness of that person, but rather you're, you're focused on a few um, undeniable features of the situation that are, are, are very pronounced and, and stand out. Sometimes these models, you know, my students will sometimes see me asking them to build models like this. And, um, and I sometimes think about them as kind of, axiomatic models. I say, okay, we're going to create a set of undeniable clues about this situation. You know, I don't know how to model intimate partner violence, you know, in a really good way, but I know some undeniable features of in intimate partner violence. Let's, let's list them out here. Or it may be that we're seeking to characterize trust as it relates to interpersonal of uh, relationships, maybe between a patient and their provider. Um, and, and I'm going to list out, you know, some features of trust that are known from the literature or are known from direct experience. A lot of these are sometimes common sense characteristics. And we say, look, we're going to build a model that 
we're not going to claim it represents a particular situation, a very particular situation in its details, but it has to adhere to all these axioms. It has to adhere to all of these, you know, basic features of the situation. It has to have face plausibility in terms of capturing these features. Um, and it turns out if you're thoughtful, you can you can often do this in some very powerful ways and pick build up models that teach you something based on those features. You learn things from the model. It, it picks up certain features of the situation. By contrast, over here on the right are theory explication models. Here, we have fairly well-defined theory. Maybe it's theory about how um, chronic kidney disease proceeds or how stages of COVID infection as seen in clinical encounters as well as in public health contexts. Maybe you have theory about the spread of you know, drug-resistant organisms. Um, and you seek to build models on the right-hand side, which might examine a particular environment. You have this basic theory captured. There may be variants of it you're not sure about, but it's basically the structure of it is quite, quite clear. A lot of the main players and, and stages and, and you know um, stage to stage progression transmission mechanisms maybe are clear. And very commonly here on the right hand side, your focus is on capturing empirical data, making sense of that empirical data, utilizing it. Over um, and, and there's many published and operationally employed ABMs um, for policy and decision making that live over here on the right where they examine trade-offs between different interventions. They try to project forward where how COVID might go, you know, in the Delta wave. Um, they seek to understand how multidrug resistant organisms might respond to changes in metaphylaxis and prophylaxis in treatment delivery of antimicrobials in a in the context of feedlots or something like that. So here on the right-hand side, there's a lot of the kind of nitty gritty, um, you know, use of models for very quantitative results, cost effectiveness estimates, estimates of, of you know, gain and life saved by the COVID vaccines. That's all over here. And my lab has traditionally played a great deal in that space and since my first policy modeling in the late 90s, that's been a lot of my bread and butter. But the truth is that I, I increasingly do a lot of work over here on the left-hand side in caricature models. Now, here's an important difference. And, and I want to I stress, unless you hear this distinction, you look at an article in the literature, you, you may not know this distinction, and it seems strange to you, like, because... You're expecting it to be one of these models that you've seen many papers for, and instead it's got very little real world data. It's not mod it's not simulating a particular context. It's not seeking to to use, you know, um uh data from from particular published sources. It doesn't have deep theory behind it. And and you think, oh, this is this is invalid. This isn't this isn't a legitimate use of modeling. No, it's actually a different use of modeling. It's a very different use of modeling. And some of the most powerful models, some of the most general models, some of the models that have changed people's thinking scientifically the most, depending on the left hand side here. And we're going to see one or two of them today. Okay. Um, so the goal on the left is not to have this developed theory. And to say, what does it mean about the trade-off between this and this? Or where is it going to go, you know, in, in the next little bit? It's, it's more to sharpen our thinking. It's to sharpen our understanding of what's needed to explain certain phenomena. It helps us know kind of what's up. Sometimes in, in health sciences, we speak about a minimal data set. 
that we need to collect? This is kind of like, a, what's a minimal model to account for certain pronounced features of how antibiotic resistance spreads or what have you? Um, and what's really important to realize is that the relationship of these different points in the spectrum to data is profoundly different. You will, you will see a lot of people who will tell you, you don't have data about this situation. You can't model it. You can't build a model if there's no data. A model without data is myth, they'll say. You know, you're not, you're not delivering any value. You're, you're, you're creating fables. You're just speculating with, to no purpose. There's people who will say this, you know, that, wait a minute, like, you can't even think about doing modeling here because we don't have any, any data to go by or we have very little data. So there's no way you can do that. Don't look for your keys over here. It's dark. There's no light there. You can't look for your keys. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm, you can see I, I, I'm uh, questioning the wisdom of that. Attitude. The problem is they're very used to this sort of modeling over on the right-hand side. When they think about modeling, that's the, they, they think that's how it's defined. You have to model this way. Again, some of the most powerful, published, rigorous modeling work has been done on the left-hand side here. And, and that work has been highly influential, not so much to directly advise policy, but to shape people's thinking. Um, and I will say most boot camp models are simple enough, they fall more over on this left-hand side. Um, but they're actually a little bit sometimes too complicated to, to service this. They're not caricatured quite simply enough, although a, a lot of them are, a lot of them are. Um, so stylized models serve this aim of models playing the role of learning tools thinking prostheses. You remember that idea from the first day? Remember a, a physical prosthesis helps us gain physical function despite our limitations, right? We have a broken foot, we'll have a boot on, we can get around, we're all crutches, we can get around. If we have a broken leg, we can have a wheelchair and get around. We achieve much of our desired function despite our physical limitations. Models serve, serve <laughs> learning processes or thinking processes. They help us think through the consequences of our, of our assumptions. Uh, and they help us reason through how do different factors interplay and could they explain a phenomenon, for example. So stylized models seek to stimulate a sort of high level insight. They let us say, look, if we just made these three assumptions. Can we explain this curious pattern we see from the world? Um, we're not explaining it for Saskatoon versus Toronto versus, you know, Prince Albert versus, you know, uh, New York City. Uh, uh, no, we're, we're, we're asking about sort of um, uh, what, what um, do you have to pause about the processes to yield certain types of behavior. So it abstracts away from particular things. Now, models like this give up some. They give up the ability to directly convincingly shape an understanding of trade-offs in a very specific, say, health context. You're not gonna be able to give a recommendation that this intervention will yield 10% 10, 10 more gain within the next year and 50% more gain within the next decade, uh, you know, over the next decade compared to this other one. You're not going to be able to do that. But what they lose in specificity of recommendation, they gain in generality. The number of contexts to which they can be applied, the number of areas where you can use this understanding from the model. Okay. Um, I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to ask you to call up a model that is a famous agent-based model that is stylized and has been extremely influential. Okay. Um, 
and we'll play around with it a little bit. Okay, we'll 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 see its basic um, the simple character of it, and um, seek to understand uh, you know what it can help us help us understand. Okay, so let's call up our any logics. Um, the AV staff last night came in and and uh, we're working on these computers um, in hopes of solving some problems uh, with the with the blanking and the monitor jiggle um, for the center screen. And unfortunately, um, uh, hasn't yet fixed it. Although they they learned some things. Um, but unfortunately, it did require closing out all these, um, uh, all the state that was um, being stored in by me. So any logic is up. We're, we are going to go and close all our models now. Close all. And we're going to go to, indeed, help example models. That's what I'm on now. And if you scroll down, there's one that's called shelling segregation. I've referred to it probably more than once in this boot camp. But I'd like you to, to open it up. Okay. Now, this model illustrates this notion of discrete spatial environments. Moreover, discrete style of spatial environments. Uh, we, we've got a grid of squares that represent different locations where there is some distance that is captured in the sense of um, a cell can, can have information about the neighboring cells um, uh, on it, uh -huh. but it doesn't represent any specific geography. These are not squares in some UTM grid used in, you know, used in geographic information um, context. Okay. So here we have a um, uh, have this environment, and uh, you'll notice that uh, at the top of this um, of this model is a uh, a slider, and we're going to end up using that. Okay. Um, okay. So. Right. Um, here, let's go to person, and you'll see that this model is not very transparent uh, at all. This is a built in any logic model, and I, I find it rather obnoxious how it's built. Uh, but basically, everything is captured in code. Um, each person has a color. Fair enough. And uh, and a variable indicating whether they're satisfied at the current time, and they are placed in the grid. So um, there are cellular automata where the patches are the agents. Here, the patches are present. They provide the environment for the agents up blank wave. Um, yes. Uh, oh, uh huh. Yeah, good, good. Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Nona. That's awesome. And, um, can they see it now? Up. Okay. Sorry. I, okay. I, yeah, I can't see what it doesn't actually change for some reason. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so here, um, agents will live at a certain time in a patch. I guess I'll 
draw them as a, they'll be red and black agents um, at any one time in a patch. And, um, and they can move between patches, okay? Um, so there'll be a black agent and a red agent, insert people, and they can move around uh, within the, between these patches. Now, the idea here is that uh, each of them can see neighbors, the, the, the neighbors in the neighboring patches, and can choose whether or not they wish to relocate, okay? And they have a certain criteria to relocate given by a threshold. And specifically, the criteria involves preferring, to what degree do they prefer to be near people like them, um, who, who look like them? Um, and, the idea is that we can give people a threshold um, if they have a fraction of people around them who look like them. Above that threshold, they are considered happy. If it's below the threshold, they will seek to relocate with a certain probability. And if you're interested, you could explore that particular um, logic associated with this. Uh, but uh, the basic deal is if they're not satisfied, they flip a coin and with 30% chance, they will jump to a random cell, which is important, elsewhere in the, in the grid. So if an agent is at a certain point, and they're dissatisfied with 30% probability, they will jump away. Now, here we, uh, we note that their jumping is to a random empty cell, and it's not directly considering who's already there. So we're going to run this model, people are going to be seated in that. Some will be red, some will be black. And we will note its, its appearance. Uh, when we start, we will then seek to let it run out and see the results. And we'll iterate in a way that adjusts the the slider, okay? So I'm gonna show you something over here in the developer panel. Um, you can actually go and run models instead of in their entirety, you can run them for a certain amount of time. And uh, we're gonna probably make use of that uh, here. Um, and I'm wondering, okay, so. Why am I not seeing the the board here? What am I not doing right? Um, it's it should be actually showing the board. It may be because I did the step um, rather than just running it at first. So we'll try this. Okay, here we go. Run here we go. Yeah. So sorry, folks. We had to press this button. Okay. So I I ran it and I immediately paused it. Let me do that again so you can see it and you'll want to follow me. You run, you right click on this and, and click run. And up will come this explanation. And you're gonna press this run button down here in the lower left. Okay. And then I'm gonna pause it immediately. Okay. So you'll notice that here's a board and there's red agents. There's black agents and there's empty cells, which are the yellow. Do you see that? Okay. So each cell is either occupied by me, a red agent, a black agent, or it's empty. And you'll notice this slider up top has this fraction of neighbors um, that they require 
to look like them to be satisfied. And, and here uh, we have people in an environment uh, that they're judging this get neighbors. Um, they're, they're looking at the people immediately around them uh, within this environment. And Wade, maybe you could check, is it here the eight neighbors or is it the four cardinal directions? I, um, I don't happen to remember the definition of the model, but um, eight neighbors. Eight neighbors. See God in the space and network of Maine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So if we go to Maine, we can see in the space and network that it considers eight neighbors rather than just the four in the, in the cardinal directions. So here it considers north, south, east, west. So this black agent here would would consider the neighbors here 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 you would ask what fraction of them are black of those neighbors what fraction are black i believe and and then it would if that fraction were above the value of this slider, um, they'd be satisfied or, or equal to the value of the slider, they'd be satisfied. Right. Um, uh, otherwise, they will, um, indeed, uh, otherwise, they will be dissatisfied. So here, for example, if the slider is at 12%, um, 12.5%, at uh, we, they will be happy if one of their neighbors were, as long as one of their neighbors is up there. If if all neighbors were full, um, all eight neighbors were occupied, as long as one of them is their color, they'd be satisfied. If only if there if there are only in fact two neighbors, and one of them is 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 black, they'd also be satisfied. Um, because 50% of their neighbors are black, um, or if they're same color, I should say. Um, so this is 12.5. This would require, if they have eight neighbors, only one to be of their color, 50%. They'd be requiring four of them to be their same color, to be satisfied. And uh, if it were 0.75, they'd be requiring six of their eight neighbors to be satisfied, were they to have eight neighbors. Okay, um, so this slider is going to determine how how um, spooked by are they are by people who don't look like them. Okay, so you tell me um, if I set this to twelve point five here, as long they're going to be satisfied as long as there's one of their neighbors out of eight. There were eight um, who who look like them. Do you think? What do you think is going to happen to this pattern in the grid? The pattern in the grid looks pretty random. What do you think will happen to it? Anything notable? Sorry. Yeah, it'll stay mostly random. That's right. So we're we're you notice they're evolving. People are moving. There are some people surrounded entirely, perhaps by. Um, people don't look like them. And so there's some movement around, but it's pretty much around the edges, right? Do you see that? Okay. Let's, let's start, start again here. We're going to, we're going to run it and pause it immediately. Okay. How about 25%? So they'll be, they'll be happy if two out of the eight neighbor, if there are two out of eight neighbors around them that are that are uh, that look like them, they'll be happy. What do you think that will lead to? Sorry. Yeah. Okay. I'm not gonna be too picky about it because it's here. Here we go. And you know, there's maybe a bit more sorting out, right? 
people are still seems like they're moving around a little bit more than last time. But it's settled down. Still pretty mottled pattern, right? Right? Um, Gerard Manley Hopkins has a poem about, like, thank God for dappled things. And this, these are dappled things. Okay. How if they how if they want at least half their neighbors to look like them? What do you think will happen then? Half. Half, half. Okay, here we go. Ready? What do you think will happen with half? Anyone? Okay, so, so obviously a lot going on. Does that look the the entropy of this? Well, okay, sorry, I shouldn't lapse into into technical jargon. But uh, one metric we use to judge how ordered a system is, a spatial system, would be the spatial entropy, sort of how much randomness there is. Was that original pattern more or less random than this? Or that was more random. This has more structure. This is more order to it. It's more, it has, it has more clear structure. You have these bigger chunks, right? They just want 50% of people to look like them around them, right? Um, now, obviously, this is not just look. This It could be <laughs> they want 50% of their neighbors who vote the same as they do, right? <laughs> Um, who have the same lawn signs on their lawn. Um, not to put too fine a point on it. Um, uh, okay, so so let's keep on exploring. Let's let's I'm going back, slowing it down again and, and okay, I'm going back to our random one. Okay, what if they want at least five of their neighbors to look like them? So I'm, I'm saying like 62.5% of the neighbors or something. Here we go. Okay, so speed up, speed up. Was this more ordered or less ordered than the original pattern? More ordered. There's more clear spatial structure. How about compared to the last one, the 50%? More. I'd say than what we just saw, um, maybe not maybe not night and day, but it looks to me like bigger swaths, bigger connected. There's fewer disconnected components. Um, okay, now let's suppose we were to yank it up to seventy five percent. They need seventy five percent. Sorry. Yeah, six neighbors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So six. Oh, sorry. Ah. Somehow restarted it again. Okay. Uh, I don't know. You want to be careful with your experimentation, and this model is no, no exception. Okay. What's that? Someone asked on the chat? Okay. Sorry, they asked what? Oh, how can it um, greater than 85? <laughs> well, I I I uh, I know what happened to say. Okay. Okay. Um. So this is even larger clumping, right? Larger more massive sort of groupings of people, sorting, the great sorting, right? Um, they're, they're sorting into like with like in a manner that is somewhat uncomfortable. Now, if we were to go up to – actually, I'm sorry. I did something crazy. Um, forget that. So, so eighty-seven point five would be um seven out of the out of the eight. Sorry. Um, 
And and at some point, what happens is what? You tell me, you if you can experiment in it. What happens at some point? Well, what happens is if they get too demanding, they can't get no satisfaction, right? Um, so they just keep on moving is my recollection from this. And by the way, the, the details of this um, may differ a little bit from the original publication by Thomas Schelling, but this came out of Thomas Schelling's work, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist. And this made a big impression on him, this model. He played it. So he invented these rules on an airplane with a portable chessboard. And he sort of played out what would happen with red and black pieces um, and came up with these rules. He didn't have a computer to run it for him, but was reasoning through it. Here, they're not able to find a stable configuration in this rendition of the rules, which I think is a little bit different from um, some other capturings of these. I don't think the 30% chance of moving was was in there in the original. But what's really notable here is, I think, you know, some of these, these uh, patterns that do come out here, I, I changed this to 70, 75, actually it's just over 75. So I'm gonna make it just under 75. So 75 will satisfy. So this model is in no way programmed to show these patterns. Right. And no and nowhere does it oh blame clip okay. mm. Nowhere does it say there need to be these connected components surrounded by blank by blank things, you know, with you know, with with uh, broad swaths of color only of one or the other. This emerges from this iteration of these micro decisions people have, right? And what's what Thomas Schelling was um, taken aback by, and what generations of economists, social scientists, and computational scientists, modelers have been struck by is, you know, how eerily the phenomenon here matches what we see in other sorting processes. And unfortunately, one of them is in the US with segregation patterns. Um, this was at a time where Schelling was, I think it was in the 70s, and you know, he knew about examples of these broad segregation in Detroit and Chicago and in you know LA area um, uh, cities uh, in some areas in the US South and so on. And and there's some really good work that's been done to show, you know, systemic racism and, and you know steering practices that are predatory and refusal to loan to people, you know, of color or um, you know discriminatory practices against uh, against people trying to set up a home. Um, but these patterns emerge without assuming any of that, right? They assume they can or they can emerge, I should say, without assuming uh, assuming any of that. They can emerge from, from fairly non-extreme preferences. Maybe maybe extreme is, is too fuzzy a word here, but you, you're, you know, if you say, I'd like half the people around me to look like me, you might think that that is not something that would be, um, you know, have have such giant implications for the the patterns of residential mixing that result. But as we can see from from a fifty percent case, there's still a lot of grouping that occurs here. Maybe it's less monolithic, but you know, there's less hegemony, but it really, it really does stick out even at 50%, right? And as you get to 60, 62.5, and as you get to 75%, 
it just becomes you know overwhelming, right? And so lots of little decisions based on you know preferences that are not manifestly um out the, you know it's it totally extreme another blank way um you know it, it's not like someone saying i have to be surrounded only by people who look like me or i want only people of my religion to be near me you know it, it it's even you know I'm, i want half the, i, I want to feel not a minority that can lead to big to big patterns and you know, it's a classic case of spatial emergence. So this model has been hugely impactful, hugely influential, shaped many, many studies of this. Now, would you use this model to make zoning decisions or to, you know, go and institute detailed anti-discrimination guidelines for Washington DC properties or Detroit properties? No, you, you, I mean, it's it's not fit for that, but it's been hugely intellectually influential in shaping people's understanding of where to look if we're seeking to undo, um, you know, disparities in access to housing and um, open up you know, uh, more diverse communities, and so on. This, this model is hugely influential. Is this about Chicago? No. Is it about Washington, D.C.? No. Is it about Los Angeles? No. Is it about Birmingham, Alabama? No. Does it, does it, um, is it of some relevance to all of those? Yes. It's a very stylized model, but it has, because it's stylized, it doesn't have direct immediacy um but it uh of, of you know obvious hard-hitting um overwhelming recommendation for any one area but it applies at some level to many 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 areas because in general yes um while it's probably not used for policy is something like this how uh you would build boundary lines for political gerrymandering that's really interesting um Hmm. I wanted to purposely disenfranchise certain voters. Could you use a model like this, you're saying, yeah. to inform, like, to use this model to help design sort of um, devilishly clever gerrymandering strategies? I think that. I'd have to think about that. I um, I know here, you know, people are moving in space. So in a way, gerrymandering is about drawing lines um, uh, cleverly where people are. This is about where they move. Um, of course, there's also sorting processes going on politically where people do move, right? And And perhaps there's some way in which, I mean, I, it seems plausible there might be some way in which gerrymandering could devilishly exploit, like, like to bad ends, exploit, you know, sorting movements to arrive at disenfranchisement, you know, strategies that are extra savvy in in achieving their goals yeah so so that's that's interesting i've i have not um not thought about that and that seems like you know there there could be some good thinking done about that because you're right that like gerrymandering is a very static model right now where like where are people right now and we'll draw lines around them but if you could understand something about the process of movement, you might have gerrymandered lines that once they're instituted, they stay, you know, they stay effective for your political goals for much longer times. So like in the U.S., yeah. you know, we do a census every yeah. 10 years. Yeah. And then political lines get drawn 
the next year, and those are good for 10 years. Right. That's a long That's time right. for representation to be decided. Right. And so I, I guess by the same token, I mean, one thing that I could imagine a model that takes into account sorting behaviors like this, and you know, preferential movement based on affiliation, right? Um, one one way it could be quite um, helpful at a practical level in, in a non-devilish way, in a way that would would actually exhibit pro-social and benefits is, is, you know, if you were to use this to um, evaluate the um, the consequences um, and, and bring to light potentially unexpected adverse consequences of putting in place a restructured set of lines of, you know, drawing lines that, that, um, oh, it went too far. Oh, well, thanks. thanks so much. Um, you know, you might be able to, to say, well, these lines are going to, because of these processes that are, that are ongoing, with movement, these lines are going to institutionalize even worse, you know, um, even worse levels of of uh, uh, politically um, gerrymandered effects, essentially, over those 10 years. So you might be able to use it to, to help critically evaluate plans for, for redistricting or something like that. Yeah, that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. A reference that uh, oh yeah yeah there yeah there's some some um some work in this literature on uh. On, on stylized models or theory building models. And there's a variety of them. The, I, I will say that there's different schools of agent-based modeling, very different schools. Um, uh, uh, so when I say schools, I mean kind of in the same sense we talk about schools of economics or something. There are these, um, there are these different lines of it and often they're associated with intellectual lineages. Um, uh, so the University of Michigan school, so University of Michigan has, because of its Center for Complex Systems, um, uh, the work of John Holland, uh, uh, Robert Axelrod, uh, they have for decades had a very prominent role in advancing agent-based modeling and thinking on agent-based modeling. Uh, some of the names I mentioned earlier, Ross Hammond is from there, um, was trained there. Um, uh, Carl Simon, who I mentioned is quoting the caricature models from there. Also Sandra Galea and Anna D.A. Rue, now head of, now school dean of public health at Drexel University. These are, Dear colleagues of mine, I should say, um, they um, they're from there, and they're a great group. Scott Scott uh, uh, um, not Scott Bell, um, yeah, but um, uh, forgetting his name right now, but um, also fantastic. Uh, that that line of thinking, they do a lot of stylized models. Rick Riolo in earlier generations, a wonderful guy, unfortunately, uh, now late Rick Riolo. Um, they, they, do, they, they have a long tradition of building stylized models. And Ross Hammond, uh, Jun Xiao, Ross Hammond has, um, I, I know, uh, at least one publication where he talks about the distinction models for theory building and models for theory explication, I believe in those terms. Um, and I think some of Carl Simon's work may mention caricature models, et cetera. Um, 
But if you look at the models that they build, they they tend to be more along the lines of what how I guide my student with like um these uh these sort of axiomatic guidelines for building models like list out undeniable facts so they talk about like building a model by listing out stylized facts and you build a model that has basic face plausibility even though its evidentiary base may be limit very limited you you don't let that stop you from publishing and for many years i shied away from that because i thought you know like the that that could lead to bad science. But I, I actually think that if you're explicit about it, um, it can be uh in you know scientifically open and and about the goals of the model and, and say this this is a thinking model. It's not designed to influence policy directly, immediately. It's designed to think through and learn about the impacts of neighborhood walkability on behavior. So they have these really sweet um, stylized models of urban health and so on that they publish on. Liz Bruch is another one with whom she and Ross and I um, co-wrote a uh, R25 grant in the U.S. that was successful and where we taught at Michigan for a number of years um, uh, this topic. And I do a lot more empirical modeling than they do. Um, I, I will say... One time there was a bit of a, there was a bit of a kind of a intellectual tussle between different sides on this issue at an NIH meeting. So we had a network on inequality, complexity, and health. And I was a member of it. And then there was a lot of people from the Michigan School and Michael Wolfson was part of it. And uh, there were a bunch of other domain experts, including Vishvish Ranath and so on. And there was an argument that arose <laughs> And I think it was Michael Wolf said, basically said to them, like, like, what's the problem with you folks? Like, build empirically grounded models. Like, like, go and find the data sets and instantiate your models with them and examine real world policy issues. You have big impact. And and uh, Liz Root, I remember saying, like, we've been jilted too many times. Um, like we we like we've done it before. We build big models, and 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 then we realize like they've left out still a huge fraction of the issues, um, and they get criticized for being you know incomplete in this regard and that regard and that regard. And she said, no, you you really want to contribute scientific you know scientifically sound small models that advance thinking about how certain factors interplay to produce certain phenomena and that a great generality. Um, and you don't claim that they have some sort of overall theory of you know, the area, that it's, that it's broad enough, that it's captured enough factors that you're close to describing, close enough to describing the dynamics that you can do policy trade-off um, studies in a sound way. And, and so there's this exchange of Michael Wolfson, who is from the, the, the uh, uh, he was director of modeling for StatsCan and a very high level person within Statistics Canada, um, uh, a, a top administrator and leader of these areas, good, good colleague of mine, very thoughtful guy. He and I have lots and lots of good discussions. Um, but he was saying, oh, come on. Like, it's not that hard, come on. Um, you know, like this is 2020, that was 2014 or something. And he was saying, it's not that hard to do. Um, you know, get your act together and, and kind of build policy relevant models. And they were saying, no, you know, it's too dangerous. And this brings me to my final point in this lecture. Yes. Oh, uh, there was a question. Oh, uh, share my screen. Thanks. Um, sorry, is this not shared right now? Oh, but they saw the earlier things? Okay, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so there is plenty of literature on this Jun Xiao, and, and broadly you will find tons of models from the Michigan School that are quite stylized. 
I will say the system dynamics tradition has a lot of stylized models that are system dynamic stylized models. And one that you see all the time, it's not from there, it's from 1927, Kermit to McKendrick, is really stylized is the SIR model. Like the SIR model is totally stylized, right? Like it doesn't describe exactly any one pathogen, but it's a really good tool for for learning about the characteristic patterns and dynamics of infectious diseases. And um, I will say, so one of my intellectual uh, ancestors is John Holland. So I have, I was trained in my first research use of agent-based models by one of John Holland's students. So I have some descendant, I have some ancestors in that line of modeling. I'm also very influenced by the MIT school with Jay Forrester and, and system dynamics and so on. Anyway, um, uh, that, so beyond that distinction, stylized empirically rich distinction, stylized, you know, like um, models that, that are, are learning, that, that seek to sharpen our thinking, to build theory, to help us build up theory in a given area, like about what what shapes residential segregation in general, compared to models that are looking at, you know, how to remediate residential segregation in, in the you know south side of Chicago in 2024 um, uh, to enfranchise the specific community-based organizations in place. Those are quite different. Um, uh, beyond that distinction this distinction that we've been talking about, stylized versus kind of uh, theory explication models. There's a distinction between models that are minimally endogenous and heavily endogenous. And, and this is also a distinction. Uh, so Michael Wolfson and I both do a lot of policy modeling. My models tend to be more heavily endogenous. His tend to be more statistical. So... So they are dynamic models, but they use, they, they basically represent only observables. I'm exaggerating a bit, but it's, it's pretty close to true. They represent observable quantities, no latent quantities. Um, and they use, um, the micro simulation tradition uses um, a statistically derived relationships as to how people evolve over time with respect to these observables deduced from census data and from various stats scan surveys, et cetera. And they put it directly into their model. Um, that's, that's based on observables. Um, whereas endog heavily endogenous models are positing things about quantities that are hard to measure, hard to, hard to quantify. And and that involve more sort of um, thinking about the underlying situation um, and even if there's no data available. And I will say that some of the stylized models have lots of those sort of things in it. So, so even for empirically rich models, just recognize there's some that are more heavily endogenous that have lots of, lots of factors that are hard to measure and some that deal only with measurements. This is the micro simulation tradition. This is many ABMs for policy and decision making. And I would say Matthews and Larissa uh, and Nona, and uh, I don't know if anyone else, Wade has contributed to it and Jenna has contributed to it. Like the HAPS model of polydrug use is like a highly endogenous non-stylized that is like when i said okay we're going to do this i i did so knowing about all these risks i said we can put our effort into very stylized models narges is several very stylized models of of substance use that are very nice thoughtful small kind of um yeah thoughtful basic data in there from the literature but they're really thought piece models they don't claim to do the bigger kahuna, right? The HAPS model takes on the big kahuna, right? And Amelia has been a great contributor to that. So that the HAPS model is like the moonshot. <laughs> and I think 
we're actually recently close to walking on the moon. I'm actually pretty impressed. Jalen deserves, you know, huge credit, right? But that's an example of a heavily endogenous, empirically grounded, very ambitious model that Liz Brooks said, we've been jilted too many times. We don't do those. Like, um, that's, yeah, that's very much, um, uh, you know, something my group uh, feels uh, uh, audacious enough to do. <laughs> and, you know, it's risky, but it has big risk, big rewards, if you can pull it off. And I think you folks have largely pulled it off. So my hat is off to you. Um, okay, I think that's all we have time for with that. Let's take a 10 minute break and um, we will be back. Actually, I, maybe I'll do a vote if I could. I'd like to do a vote. I need I need guidance on the rest of the day, okay? Because we, we actually can cover the planned material for the rest of the day without taking most of the day's without taking all today's time we have about an hour maybe maybe even two hours that we could spare if we're careful so i need some guidance and i'd like to have voting um we're gonna have to do a hybrid of online votes and votes in the room i'd like you to vote for options not mutually exclusively just if you want this raise your hand and we'll go for the ones that have the most hands raised. It's kind of like what Jenna called dotocracy. Um, right? Um, okay. Um, so we have a couple options how to use that time. One time would be, one way to use the time would be to say that we will take one of our existing models, maybe it's the smoking model, and we'll show how to build in um, some uh, some additional features with that uh, involving social impacts on smoking, but also um, custom distributions objects. So, so we'll draw people's age of initiation from a custom distribution. Um, and we'll... Uh, elaborate a little bit more on some of the structure of the model with some of any logics, other features, like maybe we'll use a table function or, or, or something along those lines. So just kind of um, extending that um, upwards a bit. So that's one option. A second option would be we could spend that time and build up a little spatially explicit model. If I could be convinced that it, if we're willing to live a bit on the edge and to sacrifice things, we could, we could do something with the GIS interface, create models in geographic space and have them move around between locations like move from one hospital to the other hospital in Saskatoon or, you know, move, move between home and, and workplaces or something like that in geographic space. And you could see how that works. It's getting a bit risky, but we could get, we could get somewhere. We could, we could do something kind of interesting. And you'd see how movement works in any logic, how you say move to, and you could see how people say, find the nearest one, that sort of thing. Okay, that's option two. Mm -hmm. Maybe some TAs could be make, make use of the can. Good. Um, so, option three. What's that? No, we can't, we can't do both. Can't do. Both. Well, unless you're willing to not. Okay, what are you what are you willing to give up? And you know, do you want to not discuss sensitivity analysis? Do you want to not discuss calibration? Um, you know, um uh okay, um another possibility would be to use our time to uh 
builds up a model that involves uh, that involves um, spread of infection, uh, specifically in venues in stylized space. So say that, that that previous one will say geography; it'll be geographic. This one will be stylized space, but spread of infection in environments. Basically, spread spread of infection from person to person at home or at workplace, um, et cetera. Um, so we could we could do that. Um, uh, yeah, um, I think I think those are some some reasonable choices. Okay, so um, maybe we could read those out. Could you read them out, uh, Larissa? Collect our existing models and show how to build and in additional features involving social impacts on smoking and custom social, social impact on smoking, custom distribution for age of initiation, and some other bells and whistles in any logic. Um, that you could use with models um, uh, to to kind of uh, that are particularly data related, or you can use to flexibly capture some um, some some types of information in the models. Um, yeah. So, um, how many people would like to vote for that? Okay. Okay. Two. Okay, that's great. Okay. Uh, Oh, wow. Jenna, that's awesome. Oh, who created this? Who created this? Is this Larissa? I didn't create that was me. Oh. That was Wade. <laughs> I just created the comments. Okay. Vote, vote. Bo oh, wait. Okay. That's online. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then in person, we had two hands. Okay. Okay. So if, if you're voting your hands in, if you're voting in person, don't vote online. As... <laughs> We're going to have to avoid gerrymandering here. Um, okay. Okay. Um, so, so, so that was one. Uh, so we had two for the first locally, uh, in, you know, in, in, in the classroom. Um, small geography, spatially explicit model. <laughs> okay. Okay, two locally, one really, really, really would like it. And we got three online for that. Okay. Okay. Next, uh, a model that's not geographic, but has sort of stylized venues like home, workplace, school, whatever, um, where we have spread of infection at those different environments. Okay, so so one in person for the last one. Acceptance voting. Sorry, are we doing acceptance voting? Um, yeah, that's right. You mean like a two phase? A two, we can do a ranked choice or something. Okay, okay, but it's pretty clear the geography one seems to be the most popular. Okay, you want to do geography? Okay, so here's the deal with geography. We can do it. It's gonna be fun, but but there's gonna be an agreement in place, okay? So if I can't get to certain topics, I will refer you to good videos on those topics, okay? And and uh, and and we'll have to recognize this a certain measure of risk. I actually think we can do it pretty pretty well and still get to at least some coverage of those later topics, okay? Um, yeah, we may also have to go light, like for sensitive analysis, I was planning to have an interactive exercise with one of the example models, like say the heart disease one or the infection spread where we would, where we would also run it. It would, it, it would run it in groups of realizations, like a hundred at a time and summarize the results. And it's possible we won't have time to do that, but. Um, we may still, yeah, I, th I think we may still have time. Okay, okay, 10 minute break. We'll be back. We'll get going. Bring your mouse. If you if you have a mouse, bring it. Frank also has some extra mouse. Oh. Mice. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, if you need one for people in person. 
Okay. Okay. So there's. Um, so if you want to get a mouse from, if you're in the room and want to get a mouse, you can do one down the hall with Greg. And Greg is aware of the blinking. Yeah, I, I told him about the jiggling, not the blinking. 